Partiban Kanan, English translation by Anand Kanan, narrated by Sujata Anand. Book 3, Chapter 13, Kapala Bhairavan. Vikraman was heartbroken to hear that Queen Arunmoy cried, Vikrama, my child, here I come, before jumping into the sea. He realized that her historic behavior may have been due to the fact that he lived at a remote island beyond oceans. When Ponnan described searching the sea, Vikraman cried, Ponna, hurry up and tell me, were you able to find the queen? No, my king. These eyes were not fortunate enough to see the queen again. In that case, why did you tell me that she is alive somewhere? Is it to give me false hopes? Alas, all the planning and all the trouble, and this is the news I get, said Vikraman with anguish. My king, please be patient. I have no doubt that our queen is alive. I have been trying to find her. You are also here now. I am no longer worried about being able to find her, said Ponan. And he continued his tale. Ponan and Paranjyoti searched the water for the queen in the darkness, without success. Eventually, Paranjyoti said in a mournful voice, Ponna, I believe the sea king has swallowed the queen. Ponan sobbed. They both doubted the queen would be alive, even if they were able to find her in the water. They concluded that further search was futile. They returned to the shore, thinking that the waves would wash the body ashore later. The eclipse had ended. Bright light had started spreading. The sunshine resembled the light that you see through the clouds on a rainy day. When Pondan and Paranjodi got ashore, Paranjodi's wife and Mali were wet, shivering and greatly agitated. The women were shouting, Come here, quick! It took a while to make sense of their incoherent story. They said that they had seen a one-handed man carrying a woman in the semi-darkness. The woman looked like Queen Arunmui. When they had screamed for help, the man vanished in the crowd. Pondan and Paranjyoti resumed their search for the queen, this time in the Sea of Humanity. They could find neither the queen nor a one-handed man in the dense crowd. After a fruitless search, they started doubting the veracity of the story that they heard from Valli and Paranjyoti's wife. Could the two women have imagined the whole sequence of events? However, the women were emphatic that they were sure of what they had seen. Ponan had one more reason to believe that the queen was alive. He and Valli had lingered in Tiruchangatanguri for a few more days. Eventually, they had to return to Uriur without learning of the queen's whereabouts. The shy white sage visited them there. He was distressed to hear of the queen's disappearance. He seemed intrigued by the reference to the one-handed man. He asked Valli several probing questions to learn all that she had remembered. Finally, the sage concluded, Ponna, I have full confidence in Valli's story. I believe that the queen is alive. I am also certain that the one-handed man has abducted her. It is our job to find them both. After a pause, he asked, Do you know who the one-handed man is? I don't know, Your Holiness, replied Ponan. He is Kapala Rudra Bhairavan, the chief priest of the Kapalic religion. He has been promoting the dark practice of human sacrifice. I have been trying to eradicate that practice. I learned that he has built a new temple for the goddess Ranabhadrakali. If we find that location, we should be able to locate the queen, said the sage. Punan was alarmed. Oh no, he might have sacrificed our queen, he cried. No, Punna, I don't believe Kapala Bhairavan would have personally gone through all this trouble for just one human sacrifice. He must have a deeper motive. I believe that he would keep the queen alive, said the sage. Ponan and the sage divided the country into two parts and started searching their respective areas. Ponan left Valli under the care of her aunt and travelled around the Choya kingdom. 
Then he started searching the other shore of Kaveri. The search of several months had borne fruit only a few days ago. Ponnan had walked about 50 kilometers west along the forest river. He had reached the base of a mountain covered by dense growth. Ponnan guessed that the wild river that he had been tracking may have originated from the mountain. He also guessed the mountain was a part of the Kolli Hills range. Ponnan had been told that there were some barbaric tribes in that area and had been warned that they were known to abduct people for human sacrifice. As soon as he saw the landscape, his instinct told him that the Ranavadrakali temple should be somewhere in that region. He searched the forest in all directions. However, it was not easy to traverse the dense growth very far in, in any direction. Finally, he resumed tracking the banks of the wild river. The river narrowed. He reached a waterfall. It was not easy to follow the river upstream alongside the waterfall. The path was strewn with boulders, thorny vegetation, steep inclines and deep bodies of water. Ponan braved all these and continued his climb. He had been climbing from the morning till the afternoon. Feeling tired, he sat down on a boulder to rest. He concluded that it was time to call the search off and climb down for the day. He might fall prey to wild animals if darkness fell before his climb down. While he was thinking along these lines, he heard human voices. It was eerie to hear voices in the middle of the jungle. Ponan experienced a mixture of fear and thrill. He thought he might be at the end of his search. He moved quickly to hide under a boulder that was protruding behind him. He saw two men climbing down. Strange men. Were they really men? One of them was certainly human. Ponan had never seen a human being like the first man. He was fearsome. His large, bloodshot eyes gave him a dreadful look. His tall stature, large moustache, curly, unkept hair, red sandalwood paste and red kumkum on his forehead magnified the dreadful appearance. He was wearing a black blanket around his shoulders. When he jumped from one boulder to another, the blanket slipped off his shoulder. Ponan almost screamed, but the scream was caught in his throat. Ponan was shocked to see that the man's right arm was amputated at his elbow. Ponan concluded that this must be the Kapala Rutra Bhairavan, whom the sage had warned of, and the, and the one-armed man Wali had mentioned. The other man's appearance was equally startling. Ponan saw that it was a man only when he came closer. He was short for a man. He had the face of a 40-year-old man but the height of a 10-year-old boy. Despite the st short stature, he was able to jump between boulders and keep up with Kapala Rudra Bhairavan, who was walking fast. At this point of Ponan's narrative, Vikraman had become very excited. He asked Ponan to describe the short man in greater detail. Ponan obliged and asked, My king, why do you ask? Have you met anyone like him? Vikraman said, Yes, but I will tell you later. Continue your story. My king, there is not a lot to add. I emerged from my hiding spot after making sure that the two men had left. I hoped that I could find their secret spot and even find the queen, so I resumed my climb. My hopes were dashed when I came up to a steep waterfall of about 20 feet high. The rock was smooth, making it impossible to climb. How did they climb down then? I concluded that someone may have dropped a ladder for them, or there was a secret path somewhere there. I searched for a secret path, but could not find one. I lingered for three days at the base of the mountain, waiting for them. They never returned. Having decided to consult the sage before searching further, I started walking back. As it happened, my king, I came here at the right time. Indeed, you reached at the right time, or I would have joined my father at his heavenly abode, 
said Vikraman. I might have met the same fate, my king, if I had been caught uphill in the flash floods. I might have not met you or resumed my search for the queen, said Ponna. Do you really believe the queen is on the mountain? asked Vikraman. Yes, my king. I did not entirely believe the sage's theory, but after seeing the one-handed man, my confidence that the queen is alive has increased. Ponna, my heart says so too. I can't believe my mother would have died without seeing me. She has been in my dreams for the last six months or so. The dreams started from the new moon day of Thai, when you said she jumped into the ocean calling for me. She appears to call me even now. Mother, cried Vikraman. Ponan closed Vikraman's mouth with his palm. My king, please stop. Listen, voices outside. They could indeed hear voices outside the pavilion. End of chapter 13